Others too, Rambert for example, were trying to escape from this atmosphere of growing panic. But with more skill and persistence, if not greater success. For a while Rambert had gone on struggling with officialdom. If he was to be believed, he had always thought that perseverance would win through. <clears throat> Inevitably, and as he pointed out, resourcefulness in emergency was up his street, in a manner of speaking. So he plodded away, calling on all sorts of officials and others whose influence would have had weight in normal conditions, but as things were, such influence was unavailing. For the most part they were men with well-defined and sound ideas on everything concerning exports, banking, the fruit or wine trade, men of proved ability in handling problems relating to insurance, the interpretation of ill-drawn contracts and the like, of high qualifications and even good intentions. That in fact was what struck one most, the excellence of their intentions, but as regards plague, their competence was practically nil. However, when opportunity arose, Rombert had tackled each of them and pleaded his cause. The gist of his argument was always the same, that he was a stranger to our town, and that being so, his case deserved special consideration. Mostly the men he talked to conceded his point readily enough, but usually they added that a good number of other people were in a like case, and thus his position was not so exceptional as he seemed to suppose. To this Rombert could reply that this did not affect the substance of his argument in any way. He, he was then told that it did affect the position, already difficult, of the authorities who were against showing any favouritism and thus running the risk of creating what, with obvious repugnance, they called a precedent. In conversation with Dr. Rear, Rambert classified the people whom he had approached in various categories. Those who used the arguments mentioned above he called the sticklers. Beside these, there were the consolers, who assured him that the present state of things couldn't possibly last, and when asked for a definitive suggestion, fobbed him off by telling him he was making too much fuss about a passing inconvenience. Then there were the very important persons who asked the visitor to leave a brief note of his case and informed them that they would decide on it in due course. The triflers, who offered him billeting warrants or gave the addresses of lodgings. The red tape merchants, who made him fill up a form and promptly interred it in a file. Overworked officials, who raised their arms to heaven. And much harassed officials, who simply looked away. And finally, the traditionalists. These were by far the greatest number, who referred Rambert to another office, or recommended some new method of approach. These fruitless interviews had thoroughly worn out the journalist. On the credit side, he had obtained much insight into the inner workings of a municipal office and a prefect's headquarters, by dint of sitting for hours on imitation leather sofas, confronted by posters urging him to invest in saving bonds, exempt from income tax, or to enlist in the colonial army, and by dint of entering offices where human faces were as blank as the filing cabinets and the dusty records on the shelves behind them. The only thing gained by all this expenditure of energy, Rambert told Rear, with a hint of bitterness, was that it served to keep his mind off his predicament. In fact, the rapid progress of the plague practically escaped his notice. Also, it made the days pass more quickly, and given the situation in which the whole town was placed, it might be said that every day lived through brought everyone, provided he survived, 24 hours nearer the end of his ordeal. Rear could but admit the truth of this reasoning, but to his mind the truth was of rather too general an order. At one moment Rambert had a gleam of hope. A form was sent him from the prefect's office with instructions that he was to fill in carefully all the blanks. It included questions concerning his identity, his family, his present and former sources of income. In fact, he was to give what is known as a curriculum vitae. He got an impression that inquiries were on foot with a view to drawing up a list of persons who might be instructed to leave the town and return to their homes. Some vague information gleaned from an employee in one of the offices confirmed his impression. 
but on going further into the matter and finally discovering the office from which the form had emanated, he was told that this information was being collected with a view to certain contingencies. What contingencies? he asked. He then learned that the contingency was the possibility of his falling ill and dying of plague. The data supplied would enable the authorities to notify his family and also to decide if the hospital expenses should be borne by the municipality or if, in due course, they could be recovered from his relatives. On the face of it, this implied that he was not completely cut off from the woman who was awaiting his return, since the powers that be were obviously giving heed to both of them. But that was no consolation. The really remarkable thing, and Rambo was greatly struck by this, was the way in which, in the very midst of catastrophe, officers could go on functioning serenely and take initiatives of no immediate relevance, and often unknown to the highest authority, purely and simply because they had been created originally for this purpose. The next phase was at once the easiest and the hardest for Rambo. It was a period of sheer lethargy. He had gone the round of offices, taken every step that could be taken, and realised that for the present all avenues of that kind were closed to him. So now he drifted aimlessly from cafe to cafe. In the mornings he would sit on the terrace of one of them and read a newspaper in the hope of finding some indication that the epidemic was on the wane. He would gaze at the faces of the passers-by, often turning away disgustedly from their look of unrelieved gloom. And after reading for the nth time the shop signs on the other side of the street, the advertisements of popular drinks that were no longer procurable would rise and walk again at random in the yellow streets. He thus killed time till nightfall, moving about the town and stopping now and then at a cafe or restaurant. One evening Ryu noticed him hovering around the door of a cafe, unable to make his mind to enter. At last he decided to go in and sat down at a table at the back of the room. It was the time when, acting under orders, cafe proprietors deferred as long as possible turning on their lights. Grey dusk was seeping into the room. The pink of sunset glowed in the wall mirrors and the marble top tables glimmered white in the gathering darkness. Seated in the empty cafe, Rambert looked pathetically lost, a mere shade among the shadows and Rhea guessed this was the hour when he felt most derelict. It was indeed the hour of day when all the prisoners of the town realised their dereliction, and each was thinking that something, no matter what, must be done to hasten their deliverance. Rhea turned hurriedly away. Rambert also spent a certain amount of time at the railroad station. No one was allowed on the platforms, but the waiting rooms, which could be entered from outside, remained opened, and being cool and dark were often patronised by beggars on very hot days. Rambert spent much time studying the timetables, reading the prohibitions against spitting and the passengers' regulations. After that he sat down in a corner. An old cast iron stove, which had been stone cold for months, rose like a sort of landmark in the middle of the room, surrounded by a figure of eight patterns on the floor, the traceries of long past sprinklings. Posters on the walls gaily invited tourists to a carefree holiday at Cannes or Bandol, and in his corner Rambert savoured that bitter sense of freedom which comes of total deprivation. The evocations which at that time he found the most poignant were, anyhow, according to what he told Rieu, those of Paris. There rose before his eyes unsummoned vistas of old stones and riverbanks, the pigeons of the Palais Royal, the Guerre du Nord, quiet old streets round the Pantheon, and many another scene of the city he'd never known he'd loved so much. And these mental pictures killed all desire for any form of action, Rio felt fairly sure he was identifying these scenes with memories of his love, and when one day Rambo told him that he liked waking up at four in the morning and thinking of his beloved Paris, the doctor guessed easily enough, basing this on his own experience, that that was his favourite time for conjuring up pictures of the woman from whom he was now parted. This was indeed the hour when he could feel surest she was wholly his. Till four in the morning, one is seldom doing anything, and at that hour, even if the night has been a night of betrayal, one is asleep. 
Yes, everyone sleeps at that hour. And this is reassuring, since the great longing of an unquiet heart is to possess constantly and consciously the loved one, or failing that, be able to plunge the loved one when a time of absence intervenes into a dreamless sleep, time at last, unbroken, until the day they meet again. <laughs>